Welcome to Talking in Stations, a podcast about EVE Online. I am Matt Uh Today we'll do the introductions first, and then we'll talk about what happened this week. I want to say hi to Arcia up there. Hey, how are you doing? Really good. Suetonia? Doing well. Awesome. Uh, we have Nick Bison with us. How are you doing, Nick? Pleasure to be here. All right. And with a brand new shiny camera, I saved him for last. It's Caleb. Now you can see what he really looks like. In increased resolution and now with animated GIFs. Yes. He's got a little headbanger B floating over his shoulder and he's got a nice and shiny uh, name tag, which uh, we're all going to try to get next week. <laughs> That's awesome. Welcome, guys. Uh, later in the program, we'll have a headliner here from Pandemic Legion to give us an update on how the war's going from his perspective. There's been a lot of activity there, so we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, let's uh, review what happened in Talking in Stations this last week. There's been a ton of content coming out. Again, I don't know if we've told this to everybody online, but we have over a million views in the last 365 days. Total, we have about a million and a half views, which is great. So we're really cranking out a lot of content that is reaching a lot of people, which is super And creeping awesome. up on 10K subscribers. We had 8,000 500 i think yeah just about eight and a half so uh, we'll have a little party uh when we hit ten thousand subscribers uh one other thing and this is the main uh thing that we look at how many unique viewers do we have in a given time period and uh, that number is nice and high i think it was like twenty five thousand in 28 days so basically every month we have twenty five thousand people that will watch unique viewers that will watch something that we put out there so all that to say, TIS is a bit of a juggernaut as far as putting out uh, content and people watching it. Thanks to everybody in this room. So you're saying we're kind of a big deal. Kind of a big deal. <laughs> okay. Puffing up, puffing up. Juggernaut, yeah. such an such a appropriate word for EVE Online Media. Yeah, and thanks to our 2,000 or so uh, podcast listeners, we haven't forgotten about you. This is always, this. you were the beginning, and you are still uh, the primary. Now, our podcast listeners that listen to the daily show, unfortunately, I am always behind on getting those out. So I just put out six episodes all at once, which is a disastrous way to put out a podcast. So I'm going to try to repair that. But you are all caught up now. Uh, everything that we put out on The Daily Show, we've put out on podcast two. And uh, so, uh, you know, sorry about that. We'll try to get those out uh, on a more, in a more timely fashion, not in bulk. Oh, by the way, if you want to see that, if you want to listen to podcast versions of The Daily Show, it's called EVE Online Newsday. Oh, and one last thing. Inside the game, if you want to get a newsletter, TIS News mail list uh, has now... Um, I think 1,200 subscribers in game, and, and that is constantly growing thanks to our uh, writing team there. Um, so there you go. I don't know. I just wanted to share that because we're two weeks away from our anniversary. So yeah, uh, we started five years ago in two weeks in mid-April. So by the time the industrial upgrade changes and the game totally repairs itself, uh, TIS will turn five. All right, guys, let's see what happened in Talking in Stations this last week. And uh, feel free to comment on this. Uh, this was, I thought, was a great interview on Monday with Noros. Did you guys catch that? If not, I recommend it in the audience. Uh, Noros that came on. Great really good one. It was not as funny as the Finnish sauna uh, uh, <laughs> and, and ice hole thing. Vodka. <laughs> yeah. We'll get to that one. <laughs> Yeah, but we had um, Noros come on, talk about some industrial changes. Uh, he crunched a lot of numbers, so we took a look at it from a high-level perspective from NullSec. Um, but then we really went into a bunch of other topics and some you know, not-so-friendly topics to him, and he dealt with all of them. And so if you want to hear his answers on stuff about botting, on stuff about... Um, geez, what else? Diplomacy, rivalry, all that stuff, it's all there. That's uh, uh, the show is called Noros Gets Nerfed Again. Yeah, you set that up perfectly. You were basically making him all comfortable, and then you started throwing some uh, hard balls. 
<laughs> I, I only do it because he can take it, right? Like, uh, oh, he, he did great. He did really great. Yeah. It was a very uh, informative interview, and I suggest anyone listen to it. It, it does actually show his uh, his his scale and uh, and that he's actually a pretty fucking decent uh, leader in Eve Online. He's a big player. All right, he's, a, so, he's a really uh, good at this. He's a great leader. I, I am very impressed at that interview. He shows uh, all his hands. Yeah. So check that out. That's again, Noros gets nerfed again. That's uh, came out on Monday. Also on Monday, our regular show came out and it was called Safe Passage to Delve because in the interview, Noros talks about, and this is the reason we pulled him on really quickly, this safe passage that came out from Pappy. Did you guys hear about that? Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. mostly just a troll though, right? Like, <laughs> I mean, I know like three people jo jo joined it or whatever, but it's the same as like the silver ticket thing. That's Actually, great. gold okay. tickets, silver tickets, uh, I, I, goon amnesty is like <laughs> <laughs> propaganda war on the, of the biggest kind. It was hilarious. Is that what you call it, goon amnesty? <laughs> Or well, is that that, the gold ticket? Well, it, 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 it's the tickets. I, I think goons should have that one for themselves because it's actually oh, yeah, definitely. more fitting to their type of uh, humor. But yeah, I, I, I call it goo, a goon or bee amnesty. I think it's uh, it's it's more fitting than than the attempts of naming it. I think, no, I think, um, didn't Ash Dorothy actually come up with an even better name than the, someone coined it Silk Road? That's just wrong. We already have a Silk Road and this is not Yeah, it. I think Noros called it Silk Road. Totally off. Uh, but we didn't we didn't know that until after the interview. Uh, well, what that is, you can find out on that show, um, Safe Passage Out of Delve. And the reason it's titled that is it was I, I was concentrating on indexing at the time. So when we go back to sh old shows, we can figure out what's in it just by the title. And that's what I've always done. And then uh, lately I decided with the success of uh, Delve Has Fallen, <laughs> the runaway success that that title generated, I thought, okay, now I'm going to do, uh, you know, a little more baity titles, I guess. So we're, we're BuzzFeed now, right? Yeah, we're BuzzFeed. We're gonna figure <laughs> we out are, what goes viral. We are viral. Kotaku. Need to get the <laughs> outrage clicks. Industrialists hate them. Find out why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it it just works. I couldn't believe it. It's like quadrupled our viewers for that one. It got over, I think it's at twelve thousand views uh, now. And, and I uh, didn't say Delve had fallen. It was this guy over here. In a completely different context, but I've been battling that whole theme all morning. Uh, I think the, the 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 fight has been going on in in our Eve discussion uh, channel for like four or five hours or something now. Well, instead of the uh, Silk Road, it's like the Suez Canal, right? Are you like stuck halfway. <laughs> <laughs> all right, a, like there's a Morlock stock in here. <laughs> Like the welcome it's rich how, Richmond. It's still like YouTube al algorithms okay. work. Like, um, it's unfortunate, but the way YouTube algorithms work, depending on how you name something, you get a lot more views. Like, if you make like a PvP video and you use the word solo in the title, you just get like way more views than other. It's probably from like Star Wars people <laughs> clicking on it or something. <laughs> I'd like to welcome Rich Richmond. How you doing, Rich? Good afternoon. All right. Looks like you have your red on today. Yes. <laughs> okay. So we were just talking about wrapping up what happened last week in Talking in Stations as far as the uh, videos and content that we put out. And we talked a little bit about the, uh, um, we'll call it Goon Amnesty. Or, well, we won't call it anything, but I love that title. That's hilarious. It's up there with Golden Ticket. Not quite as funny, though. Um, and the Safe Passage Out, I don't know if it's a meme and I don't want to like uh, put my finger on the scale on which one of these was important. The golden ticket I thought was kind of a meme because it was like, sell us, you're trapped, sell us your uh, Titan at a discount rate and then you can leave. I think that's what it was, right? And all, all of these things are controversial. I think Rich covered that part so well on the actual show where you talked about this. This is this is not an okay thing. It is mostly for propaganda purposes and 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 to do this outreach thing. It, it's it's like poking at the cracks, right, Rich? Yes, yes, it is. Though I feel one of the deals was a lot more mocking in nature. It was a lot more 
derisive and a lot had a lot more propaganda value attached to it. This one, I get a more somber feeling where, well, the people who've taken the deal, they, uh, outside of a few screenshots of people d taken and posted them as proof, nobody's really paraded them around or uh, shown them off as, I guess, spoils of war or anything. They've just been allowed to go and uh, choose where to go next. Go back into obscurity. And, and so, Tony, that's why I think this this has some propaganda value, but I kind of feel like it's a strategic move as well, which is to reduce the population to 1DQ by letting them out. And what have we seen screenshots of? And we don't know if they're 100% true, just like we didn't know Golden Ticket stuff was true. But uh, I think this started because a com uh, was it a Komodo was changing sides and it, it made a deal with Horde to get out. And it got all shot up by NC Dot that didn't know about the deal or something, and they almost killed it. And so, the, so Gobbin said, "All right, let's let's get organized here. If people are going to want to evacuate, we don't want them in there because we don't want to fight them. They want to leave because they have expensive stuff they want to take with them, not lose. So let's just get this organized." And they came together and they organized this deal, and then they said, "Okay, well." fraternity, uh, you're in charge of getting them out. And so they put together a structure on what you're supposed to do. So when you jump out, these are just some facets of it. I didn't read the whole thing, but I thought like, well, what if somebody jumps out three of their four Titans and then goes back and fights in one DQ anyway? Like that would be kind of stupid, uh, but you're supposed to drop corp after your first midpoint. And I said, oh, okay, well that's kind of a pain. So maybe that's enough pain to keep people from going back. I don't know. But well, Komodo, uh, what, what's left that? There's been some expensive stuff that's left. I've uh, about three or four titans from what I've seen. Yeah, I think like three faction titans, I think. Yeah. Those are expense, super expensive now. A vanquisher left. Think about a vanquisher. The two things that are going to go up in price, faction stuff and uh, capital, the bigger, the more expensive it's going to be. Think of that vanquisher, what that's going to be worth. I've heard a trillion, so you might want to save that if you can. All right, so that was the passage that we talked to Noros about, and then we had a show on it, and, and Rich and I were on that one. And also Funny we were enough, doing... I, yeah. I got some, I guess, uh, I got two different kinds of feedback or flack for my how I appearance. approached and talked about the deal. Yeah, my appearance. Uh, one group said I, uh, that I was siding towards the Imperium for telling any potential member who wished to take the deal that there could be consequences. You may face stigma or blacklisting or uh, more. And another side accused me of, uh, well, promoting the deal. It's, I, I, it's all so frustrating. Welcome, welcome to the club, Rich. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, you know how you're really impartial is when both sides are mad at you. So. Yeah, yeah. If you're getting pulled in two different directions, you're right in where you should be. Uh, Later on, I do uh, believe uh, there was a goon Rock or FC who talked about how it was possible for them to track it. Uh, that I've seen that mentioned around and how they tracked down somebody who left goons with their super capitals, but um, that got a bit of backlash for well being discussed because it's. What is it's that, this revenge? Notion that No, revenge they, they talked about how they, they tracked them down and they identified them and they called them out as traitors. And I believe uh, Vili just, well, he yelled at them and said, what's wrong with you? This is, let people do, you know, play the game they feel is fun. So this... I think it was very honest. The fact that you pointed it out and explained what consequences this can have for players, I think that was uh, perfect. This... Safe, uh, I call it the safe conduct passage, the safe conduct sign -up. It's, well, it's going to be highly controversial. One side is definitely not going to be happy to see people leave, and the other side is, well, well, I guess they don't get those kill mails. <laughs> well, I, I didn't realize they were uh, uh, kind of persecuting people leaving. Uh, I guess it makes sense. All right, so... That was uh, Monday. God, that was just Monday. So then we had the Euro show, which is awesome. You guys should check that out. It's about Eve and more, uh, mostly about gaming industry. That's with uh, McLeod here, our engineer on camera, and uh, Caleb and Spod, who's a member of TIS. Then on Tuesday, sorry, on, yeah, later on Tuesday, we had uh, Let the Hunt Begin with Ashtarothi, and we talked about the Hunt event 
which uh are you doing that Satonia? you oh yeah i've done uh, some of the hunt sites uh, i haven't really done it a ton i've done like seven or eight of the hunt master sites which are the harder sites in low sec just that were around me just to you know get the skins from the event and get some loot yeah, we did some of the Huntmaster sites. I think it's really interesting how when you blow up the capsules, there's a DED informant uh, corpse in the capsule. It makes me think that it's like an execution device that the Gerstists are using to make the independent capsule. Like, they're kind of memeing on the independent capsuleers. Like, you can finish off the DED informant. They're, and they're, like, stuck in in these pods that are just bouncing around the systems. It's it's pretty dark and that fits in with Eve. Yeah. They seem to meme on players a lot, don't they? The lore? Well, yeah, because they they have a little a little prize in, in the pod. So the wealth obsessed independent capsuleers are shooting them in mass, not caring that they're murdering a DED uh, em- employee or spy who was captured and put in the pod. Unlike us, they don't come back. Yeah. Well, uh, if you want to get involved with that, uh, we tell you how on uh, Tuesday's show called uh, Let the Hunt Begin. By the way, it's like an Easter egg hunt, basically, inside of EVE Online. And uh, uh, there's some colored pods you have to go looking for and stuff. Or structures. I've neglected to attend this event because I believe shooting these Garistas pods and attending the event will massively damage your Garistas uh, standings. So oh no, they don't. Uh, I, I ran them. I, they, they damage your Garistas corpse standings, but they don't damage the faction, so you're perfectly fine for killing them if you still want to uh, keep standings for Diamond Rats. Ah, but uh, if you wish to continue running the level 4 missions, you may wish to think twice. I, I don't know. I I think the faction standing drops are very small. Uh, I think it's like zero point zero one or something. Like they haven't gone down much for me at all. Ah, uh, I see. Because last year I attended one of the Garistas events, and it uh, killing one dropped me about uh, two months worth of one or two months worth of faction standing progress. I uh, didn't do those again. Oh yeah, they've definitely fixed that. I know there was one with the uh, was it like a, a Blood Raider event. Where they did the blood shooting natural rats didn't drop it, but there was like a bonus site thing where you kill some blood raider structure thing and then it sends you to the expedition for the second part that has like the more loot in it. And then killing that blood raider thing just like completely tanked your blood raider standings. Like it's like killing like a drone wall or something just fucks it by like 30% or something. I mean, I think it makes sense that murdering them hurts your standings. Like you have to, you have to make choices sometimes. Like, that's the point of the standings, right? Yeah, it, during... it would be it would be nice if uh, the Grusas wouldn't jam me when I'm killing the Ishtars that are farming them, though. <laughs> that that would be nice. the The way that Rat AI works is, if they can't break something, and something else warps in, and especially if it does any kind of electronic warfare like warp disruption, the rats really hate that. So they have like Stockholm syndrome and murder the people who are murdering the people murdering them. Stockholm syndrome. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I would think for, in the interest of getting participation up in events, that they would say that you're you're not going to be taking a standing hit, so you can just uh, not worry about that part. Of I, I I think the better solution would be to make nuanced events where you can maybe help the blood raiders or fight the blood raiders. Yeah, yeah, it would be cool if like, they were like the, uh, what's that site called? The uh, Stellar Observatory for the Triglavians, where you can side with Flashpoint. the Empire. Yeah, Flashpoint. You can side with the Empire in that, or you can side with Triglavians. Like if you had like, they... two acceleration gates sort of thing, and you can either kill the Blood Raiders, or you can, I don't know, donate something to the Blood Raiders, which helps them, and then you get standings instead. Didn't they do that with the one Blood Raider event, where you could fight either, you could, go, you could choose to go fight the Blood Raiders, or you could choose to go fight Sarum? Right. Yeah, I think there was two different sites. There were like Sarum sites. There were there, there was something like that, and then there was also a, a different kind of site, which was Blood Raiders, and you could totally shoot the Sarum ones. I think that's the way to go. Uh, over trying to make us suspend disbelief that the Gristas just don't care that we're shooting them for, for, for 
what's essentially a thinly veiled Easter. Yeah. Okay, so that is Let the Hunt Begin. Check it out. That was on the 30th. Uh, then, Nick, you probably saw this. I'm going to catch you mid-sip. <laughs> you probably saw this. I think I saw you commenting on it, but we had a debut of Ashtarothy's uh, basically little movie. It's a 12-minute movie on The Drifters. So that debuted. Did you catch that? Oh, a absolutely. Um, and as a twist of fate, I hadn't been out shooting um, drifters in a while in high sec. And after watching that, I went right out and rebuilt my sleeper slappers. And uh, I've been hanging out. In fact, right now I'm chilling on a gate trying to get the uh, Autolathian Lancers to follow me so I can spank them. <laughs> so that was, it, it, it literally inspired me to go do some gameplay I hadn't done in over a year. I remember when the Drifters first came out and they killed Empress Jamel and we, uh, back, back way back then I, I was still in Pi and you were we, on the Mars our, our, Yeah, our way of fighting them at first because they had the doomsday was just poverty coercers in mass. We dropped like 50 poverty coercers on the big ball of Drifters and Siphazon. We'd lose a couple, but they're like a million esque each. That was really, really fun because it was such a far removed uh, experience than the normal PvE where it's like, oh, bring your faction fit paladin to the incursion. No, no, we're, we're doing this in the cheapest possible uh, destroyers. And I really, I really liked that very different PvE where it's like, okay, we're going to take losses and we're accounting for that as opposed to let's avoid losses. You're uh, using your immortality to uh, to beat them. It, it was just fun. Like, we have these, like, terribly fit choristers and it's like, okay, just shoot at this until you die. All right, then when we warp out and shoot at the next one. After that dies. Uh, well, if you ever wondered what where the drifters came from, what they are... Uh, check out that little 12 minute uh, movie. It moves fast, has beautiful visuals that are synced up to the story that uh, Ash is telling and, um, you know, watch it three or four times. Really good stuff. Okay. And then on Wednesday, we had the wormhole perspective on industrial changes with uh, uh, Tiberius. And uh, I think we, I don't know where we conclude. I think uh, he was saying that wormholers, because of these industrial changes, are going to see uh, a lot of gameplay fall away, I think, were some of the conclusions. I don't know. So, Tony, do you know how wormholers are going to handle these changes? Uh, well, I'm not too sure. It's going to be a lot harder to like build locally inside wormholes now, right? Because you need to import all of this uh, high-volume gas uh, from low-sec or high-sec, or at least you need to... Uh, bring in the components so i'm not I, i'm not entirely sure how uh, voluminous it is i think that's the main bottleneck right is yeah. bringing in these large volume of goods into the wormhole that you have to do this extra because they're bringing in compressed ore isn't that difficult into a wormhole you know just fill up an a cater i think you can build like two dreads on that if compressed ore whereas you know now it's funny. like a lot more stuff it's funny how heavy the gas way, is right? sorry go ahead and it's just it also goes the other way, right? It 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 also brings some gameplay and some advantage to to wormholes, which is uh, going to be interesting to see. So so there's an up and a downside to to these changes for wormholes, but uh, I'm sure they're gonna. I, I think they're gonna net benefit from this. That's yeah, particularly uh, low class, I believe, right? Like the gas that's in C fives right now, uh, which is very val valuable. I think what CCP did with the industry changes is they, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is they added the gas that isn't being used, like the ones you mine in like low class wormholes, like C3s, C2s. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, in course, theory, there'll be a lot the... more day tripping and people for them to kill, which would be yeah. nice. And I all the they... reaction uh, policies that will follow because all this needs to then be reacted as well. So, definitely, there's going to be interesting things happening in wormholes and low sec. I thought for capital ships, uh, the heavier gases or C5, C6 gases were required for the larger ships, but... Uh, yeah, they, they might be. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure anybody's going to be building super capitals after this. We'll see. 
Um, then on, so that was wormholers. And then on uh, Thursday, we talked about how to cash in on this industry update. Another Clickbait. Bait title. Clickbait title. Um, do you guys have, what, what are your guys' uh, advice to people before this hits? How do you, how do you make money on this? Do the opposite of what everyone is telling you. Because <laughs> if you move <laughs> with the lemmings, you're not necessarily going to win. Find the opportunities and always move against the market. Something about buying jump traders, I thought. Uh, oh jump traders even changing all that much? <laughs> no. You can read the entire blood of your wealth, right? I bought, I bought a bunch, and so every time somebody says that, they're, they're uh, poking at me. Uh, so I think the best way to make money from this is to have played for a very long time and just like accidentally have a lot of stuff sitting around everywhere that you can sell. That's oh, the veteran that's way really... of making money. That's really not fair. That's by uh, pure luck, but um, with fast money, it can go both ways. So if you're, somebody's looking to make fast money with these changes, keep in mind you're going to have to constantly be either keeping up or trying to diversify and finding the next new best way when this update hits. If you're looking for fast money, keep in mind you can very quickly lose that money too. So... Um, <laughs> You can either sit down and wait for and see, or you can start playing it with it now, or you can, well, start dipping your toes. But um, the quicker you want to get your money, the quicker you can also lose your money. Well, and also, that's a great point because that's so much like real life. If it sounds like a really good deal, you're probably going to get screwed. So uh, think it through, plan it out, listen to some folks, but definitely do your own research. Yeah, and then again, as I said, try to move against the market if possible, if you can see the opportunity. But more importantly, and this is, of course, the very long uh, thing, when you're thinking big money like Goon Cabal and very rich individuals, don't think so much about what's happening now. Think about what does that mean is next, right? And it's not test. <laughs> the, the, the next thing to happen is what's already been mentioned. It's the Tech 2 changes. So see if you can't try to predict some of that and what will that mean to the market. So, so you have to try to predict what CCP is likely to do with that. And again, that, that follows uh, the next iteration will be st stuff like modules and, and all that. So prediction is really just that. It's prediction. What is coming next? Yeah, I mean, for me, I'd probably just uh, buy Isogen or something, you know, like buy something that has like high volume because like they doubled the sort of, they doubled the the amount of Isogen needed in a lot of tech one subcaps. And like the, the mineral market is so uh, fluid, right? That like, you're not going to get like fucked with something that you can't sell. Like even if you lose out, like maybe you lose like 10% of your ISK or something. You're not like, oh, I now have 70 nightmares that I can't sell or something, right? And that never take all like eggs one year. And and don't do all eggs in one basket, right? If if you yeah, are yeah, like like Antonia says, investing in minerals, make sure that you're kind of diversified and have a little bit of all of them, so you don't get hit on. Oh, it was the wrong mineral I speculated on. Yeah, oh, like you know, see. Oh, I was going to say like focus. redistributions around the corner, right? So like they could just add like a ton of isogen in high sec or something. Then oh fuck. <laughs> Hmm. Alternatively, yeah. focus. Oh, have, put all your eggs in one basket. Focus on a niche that you can carve out and you can focus on, and then grow that basket. Well, as you can see, everybody has different advice. <laughs> well, not that different, but I think uh, the biggest truth of them all was what Arcia said. If you have stuff, congratulations. It's all going up in value. Okay. Uh, and then next is... Uh, so anyway, if you wanted to learn how to cash in, we gave some advice there. Um, and then on Friday, this was our, uh, we did a couple things. We had an interview with uh, Avanto, which is a wormhole group in um, the No Holds Barred. No, can hole I just, control. Can I just Sorry, hole out? control. People that don't know, uh, the word Avanto is actually one of those holes in the ice uh, and it's the Finnish term for that. It's just I thought yeah. that was a fun fact when I when I looked it up. So so they they are yeah. basically naming themselves after an ice hole. I looked I looked it up too. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny because you're in a sauna and then you walk out, jump in the frozen lake, and then you go back to the sauna or something. Like exactly I mean, that. 
Wow. Well, they're in a hole control match. Well, bloody hole hell. Control, um, yeah. No horse bard is really old. <laughs> I'm sorry. Those are my reference points uh, showing again. So they uh, resisted an eviction from uh, Parabola and Time Crit. Uh, Parabellum. Those guys, or... Yeah, Parabellum, that one. Yeah, they're the guys who evicted us from one of our holes. Mm, yeah. So it's funny because there was a Russian Finnish thing going on and we're like looking for, uh, you know, state rivalries and stuff. And they're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Take all that out. We're just having fun and they're just having fun and we expected it and all this other stuff. And I was like, okay, a little bit less interesting, but they are hilarious. Uh, so we did a 20 minute um, interview with, actually, no, it turned out to be 12 because we edited down. Uh, we repeated some questions. So we took out that and, um, and we uh, put it up. So it's like only a 12 minute little video. That you can see, we released it on Saturday, and uh, they uh, they have a great propaganda piece about their hot tubs and their vodka and how that's superior. Yeah, anyway, great spirit. And, you have to go and see it there because I don't think our uh, policies will allow the, it to be shown elsewhere. So it's not going to be in our normal uh, advertising segments. I think it's a little <laughs> bit uh, too much nudity. So if you want to watch it, you have to watch it on this show. We should, we should have done some additional blurring, uh, <laughs> but there you go. And then Friday night, um, once again, we, um, we stumbled into Friday night without a whole lot of news going on. So uh, we talked about a few things, and then we ended up with, out of nowhere, uh, the question came up. Well, actually, I'll just introduce it this way. Ashtarothi said he wanted to talk about the Imperium and how they are focused on keeping the group together and how they're good at it and that sort of thing. So that came up. And then uh, Rundle was being helpful and saying, hey, at Talking in Stations, we want guests from both sides. Uh, you know, we want Imperium guests and we want Pappy guests so that, you know, we have like a balance, which is absolutely true. Uh, and then something happened. I heard things wrong. So I, uh, became convict Matterall and brought out my, uh, my toothbrush shiv and started looking for, uh, prison justice going after him and just went crazy. And so that's what that episode is about. So at the end we put up, you know, is TIS, uh, biased news, uh, because we took about 45 minutes to kind of go back and forth on that. If our audience wants more of Var Vario uh, uh, Jesus Mataral, uh, you have to send <laughs> direct messages to Mataral on, on Discord. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it was it was actually it was actually fun, uh, but but it was you know I think informative too, which is what we try to do. Okay. So that's what happened at Talking in Stations. You can catch all those videos on youtube.com uh, slash Talking in Stations. You can uh, grab the podcasts either at Talking in Stations podcast or those, actually most of those you can catch on uh, EVE Online Newsday podcast. All right. Uh, what do you guys got? Let's see here. We got a right from Bautrum. What's that? We got oh. a raid from Bautrum. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that raid. Actually, I want the big news for me, because I think it's it's uh, it's hitting a pivotal moment, is what's going on with uh, Wrecking Crew and Snuff, that conflict in low sec. Uh, can you bring us up to speed on that, Suetonia, and, and what's going on? Well, I haven't really been involved in many of the fights. I was in a fight yesterday with Volta. Uh, we showed up uh, to help Snuff. We were in Rokes. And uh, Wrecking Crew bought... Uh, they actually bridged in, I believe, Serbs and Macarials, but they didn't actually use them. They they tried to kill the... Well, I, th I think it was a whole timer. It was an anchoring for the zone. I'm not sure which one it is. I think it, I think it, it was, was a whole timer. Oh, it was anchoring? Uh, they, they, it was the first anchoring uh, timer. They just put it down, and it's coming online today. I think. Oh, really? Because we were tethered on it, so it must have already oh. been up. Uh, don't can't you tether like when it, you first put it down? Nope. And you put the core in. I, I think. No, you get, and I'm not not entirely sure. No, because no you it, put the it, core in after the 24 hours. Yeah, so it must have it must have been like when it was anchoring then, and now it's fully functional because it has full shields now. By the way, uh, don't you have to put the core in in order to turn it on? 
Yeah, Let's that's see. after the 24 hours. Oh, I got you. You okay. put it down, 24-hour timer, then the core. And then, yeah, Sister Tony is right with that. I thought there was something where they couldn't. Oh, yeah, it must have been that, to online it. Yeah. You can anchor after you put the core in, and then you have the 15 minutes and it repairs. You can. Yeah, so it's it. online yeah. now. It's like fully wrapped. It has shield armor and hull. So it's, it's uh, fully um, functional. Oh, it's it's uh, like the other two that were put down on the grid with the Siege Green, Keepstar, and Sissied. So um, there's probably going to be another kerfuffle over that. I saw that somebody reported that Snuff bought 400 of their fighters that they sell to level 5 missioners in the area. So they're going to get ready to have their carrier blob back out again. What is this fight about? Why are Wrecking Crew and Siege Green and Snuff going at it? Snuff is trying to destroy the Siege Green Keepstar in the Seed. Just because, well, Siege Green is one of the last big targets. They've just, they've burned most of the war zone down. Um, like, all of Minmil lost their structures. And a lot of other various structures around the war zone, the low, low sec Minmatar MR war zone, have been destroyed by Snuff. Um, they killed Bastgarin, they killed uh, oh, several other oh, yeah. various uh, structures in Losek Ignoitin. recently. Yeah, Ignoitin. Ignoitin, yes. That, yeah. that was the other really big one. Um, and now they're going for the Siege Green Keepstar, which is... Siege Green is an incredibly tough group, and obviously Wrecking Crew is an incredibly tough group. And with, with Siege Green and Wrecking Crew and all their friends and some little help by the militias, uh, it's, it's a lot of people, and Snuff is... For, and for like the first time in probably all the all of these engagements, the smaller entity, but um, they do have the resources to keep keep uh, getting really big engagements and <laughs> getting a lot of kills. So they're going to keep farming it probably until they eventually succeed. I think. There's been a lot of uh, really bloody fights in Lantern, uh, Succeed, and other. Uh, and some of these regions, sorry, uh, systems near, particularly close to Amamake. Uh, so far, we've seen a lot of deaths on the side of uh, Wrecking Crew and friends uh, in the attempt to destroy the fortress out of the core. I think they managed to, uh, every time so far, uh, in the two fights, two or three fights, snuffed out and their friends, uh, no handlebars, uh, hard knocks, laser hawks, and Volta, and maybe a a few other groups off the top of my head but they've been able to right? yes and it, it was, was there the last there. time yeah yeah and it was there in a kiki, in a kiki fleet they've managed to uh, hold grid uh, every time so far and they managed to extract the fortasar's uh, citadel core to be reused in a structure they immediately re-anchored i think they're quite content and happy with the destruction so far and i believe somebody in baltram's group believes there's a conspiracy going on with the Macarials. Yeah, I think that's mostly just a meme. <laughs> but they, it's I really hope so. But... They, uh, they, they, there's just normal people buying up Macarials now anyway because of the industry changes. And then the day after the industry changes, uh, Wrecking Crew lose like uh, 90 max or something. Yeah, so yeah. they lost... They lost uh, In, I think, the Lantern fight, they lost a hundred and something Macarials. It was a pretty serious fight and a lot of things went on. It also delayed my D&D game about them. <laughs> Worst of all. But, um, yeah, because there were there was a big fight, the big fights in Lantern over the snuff Fortizar and Lantern that did go down. Um, the two Fortizar that were dropped in Seceed previously, eventually it went down, one on the anchor timer, one anchored, and then was destroyed uh, through conventional attacks. Um, the one that was destroyed while I was anchoring, I actually got the final blow on. So I'm smug about that, even though I wasn't a big part of the fight. Uh, final blow. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's just really stupid because I got the final blow, blow in a Crusader. Um, but that that's not important. It's just funny. <laughs> uh, and now it looks like the Seceed saga continues. I heard a rumor, and I don't know how true it is. But like a snuff is going to keep hitting uh, siege greens fortes are until they uh, siege greens keeps there until they get that, and then eventually they're going to uh, sp 
split into multiple groups and fight amongst themselves or something. I don't know if that's true. That's just like on the grapevine and it could just be, it could have been an April Fool's for all I know. I mean, most likely Snuff just keeps going down the pipe right towards uh, the Kamal Keep star. Oh, the Amamake? Well, they might kill the Amamaki Keepstar too. I don't know if they're going to kill that one. I thought they were, and it's weird because I think they've threatened the Amamaki Keepstar, if I'm not mistaken, but they're actually using it. Yeah, yeah, I think... It's kind of ironic. I mean, maybe that's part of the deal, right? Like, hey, you let us use the Keepstar and we don't kill it. Yeah, that'd be good diplomacy. Um, you know, uh, making deals with snuff always works out so well. So. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> like good diplomacy for today, but they don't exactly have a, a reputation for keeping deals. Um, now, other than just shooting stuff in Losec and being a, a general nuisance, which they're really good at, do we know what snuff's goals are? I that think it's just fights. get fights and content, right? Yeah, they've always. Anytime I've talked to how I want to, it's like just trying to get more out of this game. Like, that's what they do. But, Maybe it's just me, but that's lame. <laughs> well, it's it's definitely different priorities than uh, than building something, right? It's just tearing everybody else's thing down is, is the priority. Um, and the more you do it, and the more you anger people, the more you build up resistance so that you get more and more competitive fights. And that's absolutely what they do. Speaking of competing, competitive fights, though, Arcia, weren't they uh, overwhelmed at a certain point in defending the Keepstar, like the armor timer? So there was a lot of people up against them, and they had to back down, I believe. I don't know. You're thinking of a Fortizar in Sasala, um, where they employed like a standard tactic when uh, Wrecking Crew and friends had a gigantic form where they, they, formed, they stood down. A oh, it's a standard tact. Ta yeah, there was there was a lot of people, multiple yeah. full fleets. I think that but was your first full fleet or something. That was not. Uh, that was my first full fleet. Yeah, <laughs> that I was in. You've never been in a full fleet until then. No, yeah, yeah. To uh, that's a lot of people, <laughs> more than uh, most fights that I've been in. That is so funny because there are some guys that have been in the game for three weeks and they've been in like, you know, Brave or Karma Fleet or Horde and they've been in full fleets like right off the bat. So they don't get to work up to that moment of, wow, look how many people are here. I don't like the biggest fights, generally speaking. I like the yeah. medium sized fights. I totally endorse the slow burn in EVE Online. Uh, you know, the fact that you can still have moments of this is new this is unusual even with your experience and all the stuff that you've done that's great it, but it it works the other way too like somebody who immediately went out to null and did full fleets on their second week uh could move to low sec faction warfare space and have a completely new experience as well uh 10 years later right a very good point in fact a lot of null sec rejuvenate themselves in the waters of uh, faction war and low sec. We always we always joke about uh, uh, something that happens every every so often, where like somebody who's from long time from null sec will will come to low sec to show us how it's done, and they just like immediately die to the gate guns because <laughs> they're not used to them existing. Yeah, and um, it's it's just like the various play styles of different parts of Eve are pretty different in a lot of ways and most people are pretty good at what they do yeah so tony you've done it all just to uh go with this topic a little bit you've done it all but you've kind of done it on your terms uh, you were in karma fleet but you were out there roaming by yourself it wasn't that you joined karma fleet to participate in the big big fleets like how, how do you manage your career Oh, for me, it's mostly uh, i mean i'm like solo pvp is the thing that i've enjoyed the most out of uh a small scale PvP is what I've enjoyed the most from like the 14 years I've played. I actually have been in like I think almost every NullSec alliance. I was in Tester a little bit in Dreadit. I was in Horde uh, most recently. I really like joining uh, because like the small gang community is kind of like really uh, you know like really jaded bitter vets who are always like bitter about every change and like always like kind of try hard and 
you know, toxic sometimes, right? It's like really fun, like contrasting that with like, you know, you just join Horde for like a month and then you have like all of these new bros who are like so excited because, you know, they killed a condor in the Jaguar or something and <laughs> like, kind, kind, kind of uh, gets you back into, you know, like out of that like toxic, toxic like mindset for a little bit. I don't know it always rejuvenates me in a way. Uh, so- I was in Karma Feet mostly because, uh, they had like some really cool uh, SRP that you could get as a solo player. They had like shit stack SRP where you got like up to one bill a month for just uh, PVPing in their enemy space, which was like 90% of lo- like no sick anyway. So you just, you just didn't PVP and delve like period basis is a, an area that you won't, you can't really get to anyway. Yeah. You, you can't accidentally go there. It's a, it, there's yeah. a funny, funny detail here, right? Because when I hear Suetonia say this, Suetonia so being one of those uh, tournament uh, elite types, then it sounds like he's being traded too much between all the blocks for some horrible amount of money. Well, well that's one I'm way of looking at it. Them. Yeah, uh, I think of him as the the girl that got away, right? Like, comes into your neighborhood, and you know everybody's excited, and then off to a different neighborhood. But I, I do like the fact. Uh, that you get, you know, small gang gets rejuvenated in uh, null sec, you know. So again, every other part of the game is a way of like therapy for for when you burn out or whatever. That's kind of interesting, actually. Th- therapy. Uh, one of low sec groups is actually making moves up north and interfering in some sort of, I call it rental affairs. Siege Green has uh, repeatedly, inter- well, I guess, interfered with things, events in Tinal with a dispute between uh, VVV and uh, Caladrius Alliance. Hmm, did you just segue us by using a corp name or a, an alliance name? That was pretty, pretty nice. <laughs> uh, did you really say some some group name therapy or or no, speaking uh, of therapy? No, speaking of uh, speaking of therapy. Oh, okay. <laughs> All but right. I posted the BRs. Oh, there's some sort of event stirring because I believe Caladrius uh, aren't they Winter Coalition renters? I I thought VVV were also like Panda Fam related as well, right? They used to be in uh, the top right corner of the map. Uh, they were in the drone regions. They were, were blue to Pandemic Horde, which I assume probably puts them as like kind of blue to Fraternity by proxy. So I'm not really sure. Like like you know. Both of these guys at least have ties to to Winnaco, so I'm not really sure like which side Frat's on. I believe VVV is on the side of uh, Horde. They technically rent from Horde, is what I've heard from. And yeah, I I, I believe Cal- uh, Caladrius is uh, something uh, is more associated with Winterco. It's it's a complicated situation, but it's uh, some sort of dispute over an R64, and it's erupted into this renter s- dispute and uh sea green has and the restrian has repeatedly intervened both with uh dreadnoughts and also sub capitals in this uh conflict thus far yeah, it's kind of interesting too right because Cal- caladrius if i bl- if i'm not mistaken is like a japanese uh alliance and then sea green are koreans and then vvv are chinese there's yeah. japanese corps in sea green too like uh nacho battle pixies and far east starfleet same time zone. Yeah, and if if, uh, if Siege Green also has Japanese corps, like Arcia says, and there's probably some ties there to Caldrius, oh, right? Yeah, I, I believe even uh, snuffed out the uh, opposing side of uh, Siege Green has a uh, Korean corp called uh, Wife is Sleeping. <laughs> <Great name. laughs> That's a great name for a corporation. Uh, all right. Wow, this is really interesting. Got to keep our eye on the north. It's not completely settled and pacified. There's still stuff going on up there. It looks like. Uh, and Siege Green being in two places at once, or having two areas of operation, uh, that's interesting too. I wonder if that's going to hurt them in the long run, or maybe they're looking at other options. Well, it depends too, right? Because I, I doubt Snuff is really attacking them in the true prime time as much, like outside of like. The keep star timers they probably aren't attacking them in korean time zone right yeah snuff is uh european time zone uh siege green is um i guess australian time zone 
And uh, and then everybody else seems to be U.S. time zone. I don't know, Arcia, what are you? What time zone are you in? Uh, we joke that it's Arcia time because I don't have a consistent sleep schedule, but I'm in New York. Okay. So U- U.S. time zone, I guess, or all times. All right. So that's what's going on uh, with Snuff and Wrecking Crew. We'll keep looking at this. I think it has some um, threads that go out even into NullSec because, um, you know, some people say like, well, Pappy's kind of demolitioning Delve right now and that war looks like it's over and it's definitely not. But some people that are saying that are are like, well, is Snuff next? Can they finally go and is everybody fighting has had some bad experience with Snuff? Are they going to go after Snuff? That's just not possible, is it? Because you would have to bait them into bringing out their Titans in order to uh, fight, I, I assume, or you'd have to destroy their homes. Well, you can't really kill that many Titans in low sec anyway, right? Just because of the nature of it. Because there is no bubbles, there is no like AOE tackle in low sec. But Doomsdays can go off. They can go off, but to hold down the super capital, you'd need to throw in a hick. And if if a Titan is surrounded by super carriers or a lot of battleships, it's going to be difficult to keep that uh, heavy interdiction cruiser alive. Plus, uh, dread bombs. Have we seen the end of dread bombs with the expense going up, like or suicide dreads? Is that no? You, you'll never see the end of dread bombs. Um, it's kind of like when Titans first came out, and they're like, "There's only going to be a few of these." And then, like, fast forward, we have so many of these like highly expensive things. Cost is never going to be a, a way of keeping stuff that is super useful away away, unless it's like absurd levels. Yeah, and I, th- I think uh, um, uh, I'm like blanking on his name now. The the CSM dude we had last week, Kenneth, Kenneth, Kenneth Filger. He said, uh, you know, like everything's going up proportionately, roughly. So even though like dreads might cost double what they cost, supers cost double what they cost. So the maths are still kind of the same. It's just that replacing that dread bomb is going to be a, a lot harder. So I mean, people will probably be more strategic with dread bombs, maybe. Uh, white knuckle with them for a while i think but i still think people are going to drop them because you're still compa- like you're still getting the same calculation on paper right roughly yeah well actually let's go into industry uh, after we take a quick break here uh, we'll come back and talk about <clears throat> some of the changes again this is definitely the biggest uh, update in a long long time uh we'll be right back and uh, we'll be missing rich after this right Yes, yeah. I've got to go on a uh, country walk before the weather goes dark. I'd be nice there to. You go. <laughs> All right, take care. Thanks for stopping by. We'll be right back after this.
Welcome back to Talking in Stations. All right, we're here with the gang, and we're going to talk a little bit about industry since it is such a big topic these days. Uh, we've been uh, inviting people from all over uh, the spectrum of gameplay to tell us what their experience is likely to be with their expertise. And we get a whole lot of nobody really knows, but uh, we do hear their information on what their segment is like, <clears throat> whether it be high sec, low sec, uh, large scale, medium scale. But there's one scale we have a hard time finding. And uh, Nick, what, what scale are we talking about here? Yeah, you know, um, the, the really small new player side is, and I've been giving this a lot of thought because last Sunday on the Indie Show at the one hour, 28 minute and 10 second, I'm glad Caleb's back because he and I will probably disagree on a chunk of this. Uh, you asked a question about the effect of these upcoming Indie changes on the newer players. And I, so naturally, I work around the Discord and the chats and the voices, and I'm listening to it. And many folks bring up the new player and the, the new industrialist. Now, when I'm talking about real industrials, not folks that dabble in it from time to time, or the folks that have a couple of industry alts that they'll occasionally play on because it's cool and can make some money. Um, I'm talking about that new player, that real new player that is the under six months in the game, not a lot of skill points, not someone like me or Caleb or Kenneth or a ton of others that we've talked to that are those 200 million plus skill point industrialists, because this doesn't mean as much to us. What I want to hear from is that really new player, and they're hard to find. I've managed to talk to a couple in-game in chats, and I'm hoping we can get them on in the TIS uh, Discord to talk, what do they really think about it? How is it changing them? I can speculate on it, but that's all it is. I just think well, that the, 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 the argument or the angle is, is, is a bit of a fallacy, right? Because it, it's the same as uh, um, saying that someone that's in a Hulk uh, is a new player minor. No, he's not. By definition, he's not. Uh, and, and again, the whole discussion about what this uh, pass of industry changes does to to players, existing players, uh, and, and and new players or whatnot. It's really also a bit of a fallacy because the problem with the game as it was was things like uh, endless raw crawls, right? So calling Killer B a miner is basically showing that there's a problem with the game, right? And it's the same when when you're talking about industry. If if everyone can do it and it's not something for specialists or someone that's passionate about industry then the game is broken because the game of, of eve online should be so much more about specialists and and professions and, and 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 splitting up different workloads and roles in in groups and even on an individual basis and for new players this will eventually be a benefit because they the the value of them specializing and saying oh, I really like this way that uh, CCP has done industry because it's nice and complicated and I can play with my spreadsheets and I can figure out how to do deals with different people when they want to outsource parts of their industry. All of that stuff makes the game more exciting. And, and I nope. see this as a massive benefit for new players and old players alike. Now, uh, look back war mentions in the chat, you know, interested to be even a harder sell for new player. And that's his two cents. Good point, but I'm going to slightly disagree because my angle on that is someone who's truly industrial minded that likes that actually enjoys resource gathering and production. This isn't going to matter to them. They're still going to want to do it. It's the casual. Oh, I got a I got a high sec alt mining. That's who it's going to hurt, and I don't care about them. I actually think that new players will benefit from this in the fact that uh, everything below a battle cruiser is easier to make now, right? And especially uh, the the frigate and destroyer blueprints, they now don't need any minerals from low sec or high sec. They only need, I believe they need a small amount of isogen, but all of the parts to build them are from high sec now, trit, pyrite, and mexilin. So like if you're just some guy who wants to build like some destroyers for your corp or something, right? Like it's easier for you to do that. Um, the question I have as a non-industrialist is what percentage 
of industrialists or what what percentage of stuff is produced by the the quote unquote real industrialists versus somebody's alt like That's so if, if you tur- if you if you turn away people like who have an alt who makes x y z is a lot of the stock going away I doubt it because it, I think it will it may morph I mean to a uh, if you've got an alt make an ammo um, and they're like eh, it's too much of a pain in the butt believe me there's probably a lot of newer folk that'd be like I can make that ammo it's not that hard and I can get it to the market we're gonna have to wait and see but I don't think it's gonna be that bad well if you go back uh, before all these um industrial uh, abundance uh, changes, right? Before that, there was always opportunities for what you would call the smaller scale or up and coming industrialist, because there was always really, really nice margins and profits on things that the big guys didn't really want to build. You mentioned something like ammo. There was usually always profitability in building things like ammo and drones, and especially if you move to uh, even just one or two different types of of, of Tech Two stuff, right? Which is the 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 entry level for a uh, Tech Two uh, industrialist, right? When he moves from only Tech One into Tech Two, the, of course there were still problems with uh, a lack of skill walls and stuff in in T One, but there was profit to be made for a new player, and this is back to all of the things prior to when we got this face rolling infinity slots thing there was always ways to grow and and when i then hear the big boys talk about oh think of the new player well that was kind of the point it it worked for the new player but of course he's not juggling 100 billion or 500 billion of of value being put into his pipe he's just growing from a few billion to the 100 billion nav right and and that was possible it was not only possible it was a nice experience for people that wanted to get into industry and this is what we're getting back in my opinion yeah in some some uh, ways go ahead no i was gonna say uh cc edward in uh in chat says this change is not for the benefit of the new players um left-handed right-handed directly no it's not no it's not it's for the better of the game overall it's for the better of the newer player, potentially. And this is why I want to talk to some of them new and true industrialists, is this may create the niche for them. I think you need to divide what it is to build with what it is to sell. I know selling is the motivational uh, point for an independent producer, right? You don't want to just independently produce if you never see a profit. Uh, otherwise you can, you can build all day long and have a great time because you're never worried about, uh, how it sells. I think the selling part is where you reach competition that stomps you out pretty much. So when Suetonia says it's going to get easier to build for, uh, the smaller, newer guy, he's right. The cheap, the ships becomes cheaper. Uh, I'm sure the minerals will be more plentiful since they're not used so much in other ships. Now those are cut down. Uh, so those prices will drop the availability of materials. They can build all they want for their friends. Uh, yeah, and it, ma- it makes it like a lot easier socially, right? Like you don't need a complicated like distribution system. Like, like if you just want to build a, a frigate after the change, you can mine everything else yourself and then you just need to buy get isogen from somewhere. So you don't need this like complicated... Uh, if you're building it, like frigates in mass, right? Like you don't need to like source mega site. You don't need to source Zidrine. You don't need to source uh, Noxium. You just need these. Uh, just need to source the isogen, basically, which is what you can't get yourself, or you can't, you know, make a deal with some high sec miner for. And maybe yeah. we need to really discern and 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 differentiate between uh, manufacturing and crafting, right? If if you're playing Eve and you're crafting yeah. all your stuff yourself and that's the way you want to do it and you want to be self-sufficient and all this stuff, it's going to come with a massive opportunity cost now because CCP is moving the game back to manufacturing, which is more what industry is supposed to be about, that I'm actually supposed to build what is profitable, not necessarily uh, mine everything myself and then sell at what is effectively a loss. We're getting industry back, we're, and this is a huge change. And as I said earlier in chat before we were on the show, I can now tell my old industry friends, coming back to EVE makes sense because they're fixing the game. The game is actually coming back, the stuff that you love to do. 
That, uh, by the way, we did invite uh, and discussed, interviewed actually, uh, Thanek, who is a new player. I think he's under six months, and he's already on his way to building a corporation and alliance. And uh, he's built a bunch of stuff. He's very industrial minded, and he's doing it all um, with videos, so you can see his progress and stuff. And we we took time to interview him, so it's not like we didn't find somebody that was new. It's just the brand new player. To me, it's hard to define. You define it as under six months, but it's really not time. It's more cons- like how mature are their concepts of what they're doing? Where are their chief goals? Because somebody under six months like Thanek is already like looking at alliance leadership and getting involved in all that stuff. And that just seems very advanced. Like he's moved up so fast. I used the six months as just a, a benchmark to give myself something to work with. Sure. Yeah. There's always an outlier that that hyper performer, which is what this guy obviously is, um, that may not be representation of the majority of that newer player. And that's kind of who I'd like to. Yeah, the ordinary, ordinary man. If you're that ordinary man and you like resource gathering and building stuff, get your butt into the TIS Discord. I want to talk. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Uh, That's who we want to talk to on a lot of levels, not just industry. But, you know, you're new to the game. You don't have to wait a year or five to be able to have a voice. Come into talking in stations and uh, let's let's talk about your experience. But it's a bit of a problem to even talk about this new player experience when CCP defines new player as the first 60 days. It is massively limited what you can really do in EVE in the first 60 days, whether it's PvP or PvE, whether it's shooting things or doing industry or doing markets or whatever. And again, I'm almost inclined to say that you're still on the edge of an alpha account and an alpha account shouldn't really be able to do much, right? They should only be able to be support for someone else's work because until you upgrade yourself into Omega, you are not even, well, you're a fledgling, you're not even a new player. So when should you be able to access and and utilize industry? And I'd say only when you're like three or six months old. And even then you might be expected to inject stuff because that's exactly the same as in PvP. Well, again, there's there's just too many disciplines in here. We all call it industry, um, but some of the stuff that we're talking about pertains to uh, construction of items. Uh, I love the idea of cutting out crafting as a sub uh, because building your own gear is just, it's, you know, you can build a hundred as easily as you can build one. It's just a matter of putting in more minerals. So it's, a, it's just an issue of cost, really, and a little bit of hauling, I suppose. Um, but uh, when you're when you're really I'm sorry for interrupting when you're new acquiring those additional resources to go from one to a hundred is an issue yeah and that's the drive for isk right that's why everybody wants to know where can I make money some people will just pay money buy plex sell plex get money or get isk be able to do things other people say what's what's lucrative what can I do what can I set myself up for to generate isk so that I could do this other gameplay and there's a ton of that that goes on in eve planning out how to make ISK so you can have freedom to do the things that you want to do at the scale you want to do them. The thing is, we haven't even talked about marketing. We haven't even talked about where to sell your stuff uh, and all the dynamics about selling stuff in an area that's not so populated at a slower pace or going to the big city of a trade hub and trying to compete with the prices of people who have incredible amount of discounts when they build. You can't compete against that. So uh, I think there's a natural pressure to go out and find a different place to sell, but there's just aren't, there aren't enough people in an area to purchase things every day. So you don't see yourself accumulating uh, wealth fast enough. There's a lot of dynamics, but I don't know. It depends on how big you are, right? Like, I mean, if you, if you sell in like some offbeat mission trade hub and you're making 10 million a day, obviously, you know, that sucks if you have a hundred bill, if you're worth a hundred bill, but if you already have like a hundred mil, right, you're making ten percent. That's yeah. pretty good for for per day, right? So, but again, no, back, I, I totally back agree. to the back to the distribution of space and back to something like what happened with infinite slots, right? When we got that, everything centralized, and then no one really cared about local markets or even trying to source stuff. But before that, you could easily make 50%, 100% markup on some items. I used to sell a lot of barges near uh, ice mining uh, areas because people will pay for convenience. 
But now, if everyone is forced to centralize to to Jita, then there is no local markets ever. But but again, uh, balance of trade and, and and arbitrage will come back if we actually get some of these changes into the game. Yeah, the uh, I'm looking for questions there outside in uh, in chat. You know, one thing, Caleb, uh, you and I probably commiserate on this is that regions used to have a lot more maybe they still do character like i think of every shore as a mining colony basically a mining region where it was very slow uh but people left you in peace to mine well except uh you know galente ice interdiction uh suicide catalysts that would come and kill one of your ships every once in a while but generally that area was like i could go there and set myself up for industry had pretty good access to uh <clears throat> Dodixie and had good access to ice, good access to other stuff. And uh, there was more texture to the world before nothing mattered. <laughs> you know, uh, I think when they were trying, when CCP was trying to help new players by making slots unlimited uh, and lifting that bottleneck, which was a bottleneck that turned me off. Like I, I didn't feel like I could compete anywhere near a trade hub because those slots were always full. So I'd have to go far away and build my home in some remote area just to have a slot that I could research in or something. Uh, no, but, when they, but when they fixed all that, they said unlimited slots. And that's great for someone like me in that position, a new player. But I kind of feel like that, uh, that kind of broke some things afterwards. Nick, sorry about that. Go ahead. Now you, you mentioned that you know that bottleneck of slots and availability is what kind of turned you off. On the opposite side of it, that is exactly what drove me to to fight to get my standings up enough so that I could drop a pass in high sec of my own and run you know be able to research my blueprints without waiting thirty days in a queue to be able to go ahead and build without those extra queues and waiting time. And you know that was my that was my impetus to try harder. You know, this reminds me of something that CCP said in E Vegas in 2019, uh, and that was um, uh, that at a certain point there is a lot of um, trouble growing past your size, and that's usually about 100, 125 people. It's not any of the psychology BS about Helms you know, or whatever it is. This is more uh about actual yeah. physical communication structure don't make fun of me don't You're looking make for fun dunbar's of... number and it is a psychological thing it's yeah. it's it's the scale of how much how many people one brain can handle intimately where's it is it convict, is a thing and, and where's my will... convict outfit yeah you see, you see <laughs> no, it every kidding. time uh on on the gross scales of organizations and you see it a lot in eve when you hit the first 50 when you hit the first 100 to 150 people when you need to scale above that when you need to scale above i think it's about 500 it's just you have these stages of development where new challenges and new things need to be done because, yeah. well, it, it's just human right. behavior that you're Okay, I'll, I'll accept that. Then maybe I was wrong about that. Maybe it is psychology, but it's communication. So what CCP was saying in this conference, this was one of the workshops, was that a, a group will get an IT person at about 100 people because they need that IT person to start doing uh, communication centers like forums. Uh, like gathering people's emails and just basically keeping track of that many people takes an IT guy. And once you get an IT guy and once he puts together some security so that not everybody can penetrate and uh, be a spy, well, that that 100 person group can now grow up to 10,000 people because the infrastructure is so good at scaling. So now it doesn't matter if you get 100 or 200 people or 2,000 people, it's the same high-level technical infrastructure that you need for those two groups, even though they're completely different scale of groups. So I kind of feel like that's um, that kind of complexity. It's just too much complexity for a certain size. But once you get past that complexity, your growth potential is too big. I wonder if industry has something similar to that. Like it's really hard to get into manufacturing. You can do crafting up to a certain point, but then when you get into manufacturing, once you cross that barrier, you can just create 10,000 as opposed to 1,000. It doesn't make any difference. In other words, there's too much gravity at the beginning. 
and not enough gravity at the end. Well, again, this is this is about growth speed, and and with these changes, and when we get these, it's not pulling up the ladder behind them from from the big guys. On the contrary, this is actually sharing all the points of of profit making down the 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 slider so to speak so you you will grow yourself faster doing industry than you did before because of these changes this is this is similar to the the, the challenge that uh, we've been doing in 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 markets since forever how fast can you start a an alpha account uh and get from uh alpha to omega and from zero to one billion right how fast can you actually do that and and this is the, a challenge that that is harder if there's too much monopoly. But when when competition gets shared down, then it becomes easier to grow your character, right? And it's the same <laughs> with industry. This thing will make it easier for anyone that wants to go into industry and say, I want to specialize in this. What skills do I need? Where do I have to start focus on building first? What is my progression plan? And this makes it easier and a lot more possible to get up on the level where you're competing with the big guys. And again, competition is added into the game with the big guys. So you can actually create pressure points. You can find things that they're not doing right or where you can mess with their activities. Yeah. Progression plans are life. Uh, it's like capacitor in EVE Online, I think, for long-term and, players. And, and, and one of the arguments is, but what about NullSec uh, people? Well, NullSec people work on some sort of socialist communist sweatshop scheme and i can't do anything about that you can't you can't compare uh, compare that and, and and compete with that there's no way of competing with slave labor there's no way of competing with uh, infinite isk but again they're just taking massive opportunity cost hits all the time because they have infinite amounts of wealth on that and that's nothing that ccp can ever solve just like they can't solve the n plus one pro problem they can't solve this kind of problem either all right. Anything else uh, that you guys want to hit on for this these uh, changes that are coming? Theoretical, I don't know, shifts in industry. By the way, Suetonia and Arcia, do you guys like these changes? I think I think they're pretty cool. Like it's a good thing to uh, make sub capital ships uh, cheaper below battle cruisers because that's mostly what I fly. I mostly fly yeah. like cruisers, battle cruisers, and frigates. Kestrel, so, right? Yeah, I fly the Kestrel a bunch, but I also fly like cruisers quite a lot too. And so, like, I'm, I'd be really happy to see like battle cruisers go down by twenty million isk or so. It's so, like right now, like, uh, it kind of feels like it, like everyone in Nord sectors flies hacks, and so you have to fly like a solo ship that can beat that. Which, uh, like, the, like cruiser, like with cruisers, it's very hard to like make a tech one cruiser that can kill a PvP fitted hack. So like you can't you're kind of forced into like either flying a, like a battle cruiser I think or like you're a hack of your own but then you get into like having to spend like three hundred to four hundred mil to solo PvP at, le at least if we we're talking about like your own hack or like a Vedmac or something right like if you want to go mm -hmm. cheap like you can fly like a Harbinger or an Omen Navy but even then like they, <laughs> they still feel like pretty pricey. Uh, I saw yeah. RC a wiggler yeah. as as Ivan lines. Uh foremost harbinger whelper um i i'm not gonna complain if they go down in price uh they they went up in price a decent amount i i'm an older player so it it wasn't like debilitating to me but not gonna not gonna complain if the price goes down and i can be even riskier with them <laughs> Oh, I just want like I want nullsec groups as well to fly more of the the engageable stuff, right? Because like you know, like back in like pre twenty sixteen, before the floodgates opened with the Citadel expansion, like people did Caracal gangs all the time. People did Drake gangs. People did you know Ferox gangs instead of just Munins or carriers all the time. So I, I really like to like fight like just more engageable gangs as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Arcia, do you like these changes? I'm going to tentatively say yes and say ask me again after we're not just speculating and we've seen the effects. Yeah. Shrewd players. 
Okay. Like I said, I'm not an industrialist myself, so. Yeah, I know you come at the uh, game from a a different angle, uh, but I just wanted to see if uh, you know you also talk to a lot of people. You're influential. Uh, And let me open the question up. People around you, uh, what do you sense? People afraid? People just waiting to see what happens? Or people excited? I think pretty much everyone that I, I've seen uh, is either excited about the change if they're industrialist for the most part, or if, like, if they're just PVPers like using capital ships, they're, they're a little worried, but they, they recognize that this is necessary for the health of the game sort of thing. So I, I think most people are uh, uh, positive about it from what, who I've talked to. I think... I think the- People are just waiting to see what happens. I think some of the industrialists who had something like a chain set up that they had been working on are a little annoyed um, because they like set up a chain for capital production or they set up a chain for some tech two production or something. And now what they work to set up is, is broken. So they're annoyed about that. Um, people who produce simpler things, I think, are happier. But... Yeah. I think overall the opinion of those around me is all right, let's see what what, what happens. Yeah. I think, Nick, I think you wanted it's to... Worth to just mention because oh, now it's been mentioned in chat. People are saying, I hope they don't do X, Y, and C. And and I, I would just like to say that if I'm not mistaken, at least the first thing that they are going to do next is going to be the T two hall. They've said that already. And it would be expected that after T2 hulls, they might be looking at uh, modules. So T1 and T2 might actually hit at the same time. Then I'm expecting them to do some uh, tweaks with the T3 and wormhole uh, live stuff. And at the end of all this, they're going to look at structures. Because it does not make sense economically that a Titan is more expensive than a Keepstar. So they will get around to these things and they will do it in the right order. So... If you are betting on them not doing it, you're doing that at your own risk because I am 99% sure they are going to do that. Yeah, I'm really, really excited actually for uh, Tech One modules because they already kind of have a, a working system in the game where for the uh, for the Meta Dread stuff, right? You need a Tech One module plus some rat poop to make a Meta <laughs> cap or rat, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, rat, that's good. rat poop. That, everyone just calls it rat poop that I, that I talk to. Yeah. But, uh, you know, right now uh, you can kind of mine with guns, right? Because NPCs drop meta materials that you can then reprocess. A lot of that's happening in Norsec right now, actually, with, you know, Ishtar farming where you drop an MTU, you get about 20, like 15 million of minerals on average from reprocessing the meta modules you get from a haven. And so what I would really be excited for is when they eventually, like hopefully they just seed blueprints for the meta meta modules uh, like they have for the dread uh, meta modules, and then the rats will no longer drop those modules. They then j- just drop rat poop that you use with the tech one version. So that would actually be a very big buff for uh, new players, I think, right? Because like experienced industrials don't want to be filling up their queues with like tech one webs that get turned into like the fleeting webs that everyone uses. That's that's a job for like a new player. And again, uh, I don't I don't know if you remember yeah. Suetonia, but back in the day, meta modules ha- actually had utility and invention. Um, there, there is the possibility that they're going to consider looking at that again, and I can easily see a future where they're going to put meta modules back as as uh, uh, in, invention uh, tools and, and have that utility. And I would also not be surprised if they allow us to use meta modules to actually build Tech Two stuff. Right? The, the changes the like these the- to invention and to T Two production is definitely something that I can see happening because them removing those utilities was a little bit of a problem. And you can even do interesting things. You can say, well, if you use a meta one module when you're building a T2 module, if we have something like slot limitation, they could build that at a bonus of say 5% faster, right? There's many things that can happen with invention and tech two production. So keep your eyes open because I think they have some ideas and plans with all of this. It, it, they the, the, they are the, not gone, working. Hold on, on you've gone like three subjects. And now I, I just wanted to like squeeze in for newer players. The meta modules used to be uh, add to your percentage of successfully inventing. So if you sacrificed a, a higher loot drop module, you would get a better percentage of actually getting your T two if you wanted to do that. I want to get Nick in here though. 
Uh, did you want to say something earlier or has the moment passed? Well, no, uh, it has not really passed. Um, it was on the subject of the changes when uh, Satonia and Ariel were talking about it. And I'm like, the folks that that I've dealt with personally that have been the most upset about the changes, it doesn't really affect them. They're, they're upset for somebody else, for that other player. And it's like, yeah, I really don't care. Um, you know, I, I want, I, I know I'm sounding like a broken record. If you're that new guy, jump in the freaking discord, brother. Yeah. Let the new guys talk for the new guys. Yeah, I get you. Uh, that's true though, Caleb. What, um, Let's face it, some of the guys you run with are super mad about these changes. Uh, Jurius Doctor actually has just got an article coming out on INN Monday where he talks about how this is going to create a caste system and the rich guy at the top is going to benefit and the poor guy at the bottom is going to struggle. Well, just like all of the time, right? Like it's like <laughs> an argument. It's the same as like whenever CCP nerfs raw calls, there's always like the think of the new bro in a raw call or something. It's just a ridiculous argument. But the new bro. It, it's almost it's almost like the proof that this is someone that's in the wrong. If they if they use that, right, it's like you've already lost the argument. If if you if your go to is think of the little guy or think of the new bro, then it's because you don't really have a, a, a meaningful argument uh, ready. Because usually when you then ask them to prove it, they don't. They just talk about the fact that chip kings and, and the big boys are the strongest. Yeah, that's always the case. But again, are you adding points of pressure? Are you adding uh, points of failure? Are you adding competition to, 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 to the whole procedure? If you are, then you're actually benefiting the little guy because you're creating something that can actually uh, make the big boys lose. This is why I keep saying I love nerfing my own gameplay uh, because that makes it fun and it makes it challenging. And, and, and all of these things are doing that. And, and the fact that it's breaking so many people's spreadsheet, it, I think it's wonderful. Of course, you can then say, well, the people that are best at, at making spreadsheets will then have an edge because they're going to finish the new ones first. Yeah, but that's at least meta. It's, it's, it's not a, a game design that they're better. And again, you can easily be a three months old character and be amazing at spreadsheets and be able to do this on on par with the, the old boys club, right? Yeah, and like whenever whenever something like this happens, right? Like there's so many new professions that are being created. There's lots of vacuums that need to be filled that that aren't filled right now, and that's perfect for a new player to go in. Like you could totally jump in and be you know the the guy that people go to for gas in in kadari losec or whatever right absolutely uh okay and there and by the way there's a title i love nerfing my game caleb did it again with the uh the great uh titles i've been overtaken by so many of the of the new bros that started playing in markets I, so many of them have overtaken me it's like crazy all right. Well, we're gonna Maybe take a commercial. Out mine. We're gonna take a commercial break, and then we'll come back and talk about war. Our principal guest is Fleet Commander Headliner from Pandemic Legion. Unfortunately, he's on duty still. There's some emergency fighting going on in Delve, which he's involved with. So we'll do our best to bring you up to speed on all the activity that is happening over this weekend and what happened over the last uh, oh two weeks since we've been talking industry. We'll be right back after this.
All right, welcome back, Talking In Stations. Uh, we are now going to talk about the war region in Delve, where a lot of activity is happening, both production and destruction, mostly destruction, as Pappy continues to attack the Imperium's home of Delve uh, and those regions. This war started July 4th, July 5th, around that area, and has been going pretty, pretty steadily since then, uh, with a few lulls and a few plot twists. Uh, but here we are, um, pretty much getting close to a year, and uh, let's find out what happened over the last two weeks. So um, on March 20th, there were about 530 stations left in Delve, and uh, that has been whittled down to, like, in seven days, really, 322, it looks like, Um I, I think actually the, the the story is more clearly told by keep stars that are falling because Imperium was thought to have about 60. That thought wasn't true, but that's just kind of what was out there because people didn't go around counting them. It's just what people would say here or there. Well, there were actually only like, uh, I believe, 40, 48, which is a lot. It's like near 50, right? So of those, uh, a lot of them have been destroyed already. And... Um, that's how many were in uh, different places like Period Basis, Aquarius, and uh, Fountain as well. And uh, especially Delve. Delve was a fortress, as we know. And the amount of tight, uh, amount of keep stars that exist now has been severely uh, shrunken down to the point that it's under 10 uh, outside of 1DQ, which has like five. Uh, that's their capital uh, system. But in the Delve region itself, they are under, now I believe, oh, they will be under 10 keep stars by Monday. There's two more being destroyed today. Yesterday, three keep stars were destroyed. The day before that, another keep star was destroyed. And uh, it's just kind of a feverish pace now that is a little unexpected. We, we thought it's going to be months, maybe a couple months, month, month to two months before any siege on 1DQ can begin because the I, the um, public relations department of Pappy basically said, we're not going to attack 1DQ anytime soon, even if Imperium's asking for it. We're going to wipe everything out first, and then we're going to attack 1DQ. So Mallory, you said there were 10 keep stars remaining, right? Is that including the five that are present in 1DQ1? No, 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 no. Not including oh, 1DQ. Five. Yeah, outside of 1DQ... There are nine. There will be nine after this is all over. There were fifteen, but six were slated for destruction. Uh, in this, uh, I should say, slated for demolition because really, there's no defense fleets. Not even for the uh, the gate to Helm's Deep, that E O three, I think. Uh, that one got destroyed without. There were two there that were destroyed actually, and uh, not defended. Also, G O P. That's a very important. Uh, Aquarius keep star. There's no defense fleet there. So at this point, it's kind of a demolition. And I think what Imperium is doing is preparing for the siege. And they've already told us that. Uh, I think after M2, it was all about 1DQ. And uh, although they're still fighting out there and, and uh, you know, trying to take over iHubs and trying to create setbacks, uh, they are definitely focused on the 1DQ siege. And so they're starting to move equipment around and uh, prepare for that sort of thing. So it is kind of a demolition, as uh, Caleb had pointed out a while ago. It is. But it's faster than, than I expected, so kudos for that. But still, it's a little bit of a snooze fest to sit there and wait for it. Yeah, everything's yeah. been going faster than expected, though, right? Because uh, yeah, like, in, in past fell in like yeah. two weeks as well, which was surprising to me. Like how fast uh, the initiative burned down in past and uh, like half of Faith of Bolis, like most of uh, Tenerifis in like two weeks or something. Yeah, our, our reporting from the East is really bad, but uh, a lot of uh, things have been happening in the backfields. And There's a Satya we can... that went down that cost yeah, yeah. a lot. Right? A very big one from Be but there was Ray, a, right? But there was a keep star or a couple keep stars in trouble and they've been defended, which surprised me because... Um, why would yeah, you bother, it, basically? And is it in the Esoteria? There's only like three left um, of the native uh, keep stars that three is out very of... likely to actually fall. Yeah, I don't know. Some some have been taken down. I heard one was taken down and smuggled out, which is 
better than losing it or having some, your opponent take it. Yeah, um, I believe the Federation Uprising one got to unanchored and they they took it away. Oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Two two or three months from now, we can call this the big couch swap, right? Oh, that depends on right? Is goons aren't really swapping the couch. They're they're gonna live under the couch, and, you know, <laughs> put, put the their couch. arm up and. <laughs> I, I I like the analogy of 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 they're still in the house. Like if Delve was a house, they're still in the house, but they're locked in the safe room while uh, Pappy is just rummaging through the entire house, like uh, destroying it and then putting up their own paintings and their own couch and um, searching for pennies in the couch. Yeah, doing doing whatever they want to do basically. But uh, you still have you still have the entire family in the safe room, so. And they're like, get out of our house, get out of our house, or we'll come out um, with these guns we have or whatever. And the analogy goes on and on. But the point is, they're both occupying the same space. One is very secure in one part of it. And uh, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. Like, this is still up for grabs. The Imperium can still win this. Uh, They're not counted out by any stretch. They have way too much power to be counted out. However... Uh, there is an inevitability of a conflict coming to 1DQ by a juggernaut. Pappy is a juggernaut. And again, we see like the immovable object with the irresistible force colliding, and we don't know what's going to happen. And this is where the, the other side of, of the map is, is going to be interesting. But again, I, I'm so looking forward to two or three months from now when, when this whole thing has come to its conclusion. Because as we talked about in the bias uh, episode, there's just a lot of stuff that's not really being reported very well. And we have to like go and dig like crazy people to actually find the information, especially because when you talk to some sources that actually are in the know, they, they, they keep saying, well, there's so much we want to talk about, but we can't really disclose it until later and after the war, because so many things happened or uh, is being done that is tied into strategic moves in the future. So they can't really talk about it. This is why I called it radio silence. And having radio silence is uh, really the same thing to do in big skirmishes like this, right? And even though you can say, well, Willy comes on and, and, and talks about these things and we were supposed to have headliner. And and of course, there's people showing up at the meta show. But is this really fact that, there's, that, that they're sharing? Well, maybe to some uh, extent it is, but it's also colored by spin and obfuscation and false information to get the opponent to do certain things. So it's going to be interesting to do the postmortem of this war because then all the facts will be put on the table and people will actually share the reality of things. We have to wait for like the Andrew Gruen book in like 2025. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. We just need to get him to actually want to do it because I think he was a little bit burned out on, on number two, right? That's a lot of work. A lot of work. Compiling it, sifting through what's fact, what's fiction, uh, getting past narratives. Uh, Eve players don't make it easy to get past narratives. They uh, they don't even know it's a narrative themselves. They're just well. If he if he dub- doubles the 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 stretch goals and 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 demand on how many people need to pre order, it's fine. I'm just going to pre order two. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that'll help. Um. Yeah, but the, uh, what were we just talking about? So the demolition goes on. It just looks like uh, at this point it's accelerated, which um, I I think we knew the cadence was going to go up, especially on large structures. We could tell by the clock that it would start out a little slow, but get going. I asked uh, a couple of people what it's like on the Pappy side. Are they they tired? And they are really tired. But they're really excited because uh, they're getting kill mails of their lives. Uh, two, three keep stars in a weekend or, or six in a weekend is uh, for people who care about care, uh, statistics and big kills, which a lot of people do. You don't get many opportunities to do that kind of damage. That's huge. Well, and then you have the feralized bees that are only interested in fights, right? So, so they're not, no one is really bored. They're, they're getting exactly what they want, right? Yeah. And I think that's why you haven't seen, I mean, if you want to talk slopes, uh, there are some groups that have uh, lost members because their members have gone either on to their their own way or they've joined bigger groups for more stability inside the same coalition. You never know where that population is moving. So. But if you see a slope uh, for Imperium, it's not there. It's totally solid. People haven't really left 
that I've seen. There's a little, I think there's, they're so big that the littlest move is like 500 people, which I think you've counted like 500 people leaving over the last, I don't know, month or two, but, or characters, not people. But the, the sovereignty slope is definitely coming down. So that's coming down. It just hasn't hit a point of, I don't think they're in pain yet, right? Like these two groups are tired, but they're not in pain. They're tired. No one is in pain. On the contrary, it's bordering on. Uh, again, I, 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 I joke that TTC money, which is usually taken from the entirety of, of, of the game, is basically uh, people volunteering to fund this war for both sides. It's at least offsetting the losses by about 50%. Of course, you can then say, well, but what about structures? Structures that have already existed for more than a year, they're written off. You can't really calculate that value into the cost of the war because no one is calculating it as... Uh, it's, it's, it's ROI is over. It, it's break-even point is long past. Uh, Setonia, Arcia, your views on this war... Uh... You're not a part of it, but do you even care that it's happening? I mean, as a regular roamer of the outer regions, I kind of like it because I can shoot both sides, and it does get both sides concentrated in one general place. Um, for a lot of the parts of the war, just roaming around Delve and Quirius and... Um, uh, catch when that was getting burned was all super super fun because I could just roam around and I'd, I'd shoot test in one system and get called uh, dirty words and like evil supporter of Mitanni and then jump to the next system and shoot somebody from goons and get called like Villy's uh, servant or something and like <laughs> uh, it, it's just kind of it, it was a really good Time to be a third party, I think. I mean, destruction is always exciting. So, hey, I, I like the war. It's You're nice to see the, the big toys getting smashed together, right? Yeah, yeah. Rich, you have a, a last thought on the war? You're in your Top Gun yeah. outfit, it looks like. <laughs> no, thank you. I, uh, I found this in a closet somewhere. Um, yeah. <laughs> the war... The duration of the war and how long it's taking, it's it's quite a bit longer than some of the wars that people have talked about. I think it's gotten to the point where it's... I'm hoping it uh, runs its course soon. I really do. Because a lot of the regions that were once great, uh, formerly great places to roam, they've uh, died down in activity or uh, are no longer accessible anymore. The old, um, I guess, brochures I used to give out to suggest people where to go to to roam, those are completely outdated. Uh, because of this war. This war has concentrated a lot of people in a certain area and it's changed the game, it, well, it affects all facets of the game, uh, no matter where people are. So for the better or the worse, it's... I'm hoping things return to how things were before, to return to normal. Uh, well, before... I want to I wanna say I will hope it returns by Q2, but I'd say by before Q3. There will be no normal. The new yeah. normal is abnormal. I uh, I also agree with that. I think somebody else in the audience said that too. Who was that? Um, I don't know. But the uh, I kind of feel like the game is shifting way too much for for it to go back to what it was before. But I, I'm kind of excited for what I think the future is. But it's well, up for forgive grabs. me. For, for, well, forgive me for the Taiwan reference quote, but uh, win or lose, this war will be the last. Well, not for me. I hope to be playing the game for quite a while, but win or lose, this war will be the last for many people. Yeah. Well, and, and the Halloween war was last for a lot of people because things, things got settled, careers got capped. People said, I've done everything I was supposed to do. I'm taking off. It's just going to look different. I think it's going to look different. So end of an era, this war, and it is, it is kind of an end of, end of days war. I feel like you know, maybe, maybe it looks a lot different what people are willing to risk and how they risk it and you know how we report on what what's going on in eve it'd be nice to say hey a titan went down that's important it's probably keep an eye it's the third decade that's what this I, I, I would certainly keep an eye on the ambitious newer how do i say shiny commanders the ones that haven't dirtied themselves yet 
uh, and perhaps uh, as well as the ones who have dirtied themselves, because after this war, I presume a lot of them are going to look at themselves and see which direction they go to next. They would have had plenty of time in this war to, I guess, gather some favor, gather some uh, people who believe in them and follow them, and uh, I hope to see some of these commanders take their journey elsewhere after the war is over. Right. All right. Let's uh, let's actually move into last thoughts or shout outs or whatever you guys want to call it. Uh, we'll start with Nick. Let me spring that on you. Uh oh, thank you. Or we can come back. <laughs> no problem. Uh, final thoughts. Hey, some some good comments and remarks in the chat. Appreciate it today. Um, and again, one last time, broken record, Nick. If you're one of them new guys, I want to talk to you. See you in Discord. All right. Uh, Suetonia? I don't really have any shout-outs today. Uh, maybe check out the uh, the Anger Games uh, stream from yesterday. It's really fun. Yeah. Oh, and uh, actually, Arcia's got to take off to go to practice for Anger Games. Uh my my shout out was going to be about the stream yesterday as well. The commentators didn't like our rapid heavy praxis based dingle rush. Um, just we'll get the last laugh, the last evil laugh, and show that praxis go burr. Who doesn't like dingle rush? Right. Even the name sounds great. Yeah. All right, uh, Rich. Well, I'd like to um, give my shout-outs to Baltram and his group in this uh, low-sec war, and especially to Baltram for handing me a zealot with two capsticks in anticipation of a fight. Thank you very much, Baltram. <laughs> All right, Caleb, we'll end with you. Well, I, I would just like to say that uh, it looks like we're going to have a, an almost 365 uh, days of actual war, and people that have uh, been here the whole time uh, if you think that's going to be the end, get ready for a surprise because it only starts getting really fun on the other side of this war. Yeah, both both politically, but also like with the new industry changes as well. Exactly. It's going to be crazy. It's like a, a new uh, new map, basically, right? Yeah, it's going to feel like a reset of EVE Online. Of course, not a hard reset, but a, a soft reset where everything is like up in the air. Who's going to be teaming up with who? How is all the industry stuff going to work? How is life going to be in, well, what is going to be tiptoeing into the third decade of EVE Online? It's going to be amazing. I'm looking very much forward to it. No, people are like, oh, this war is so long in faction war. People are just sitting there like, yeah, tell me about your long war, huh? <laughs> All right. My uh, shout out, I guess, is to all the people that have been a part of Talking In Stations over the last five years, especially the ones that are with us today. Uh, and we're coming up on five year anniversary. So we'll do a little bit of celebrating for just that milestone. And uh, once again, I, when I said earlier that we have uh, 20 to 25,000 unique viewers per 28 day cycle. Actually, I was wrong. It's 30,000 unique viewers that watch Talking In Station content um, every month, basically. So that's a pretty astounding reach. Again, if you put all that together for 365 days, we have like over a million viewed. Uh, is that a million views? Yeah, it's like a million, million more than a million views. It's actually like 1.4. Uh, I want to say 1.2 million views in a year. And, uh, and we're about, I think, two months away from when we really started spinning up. So I expect that number to go up and stay up for a while. So uh, again, thanks everybody at Talking In Stations and everybody who's been a part of Talking In Stations in the past for, for getting us here, especially you who come to watch us live and cheer us on and give us information and then tell us when we're off. We appreciate all of that. And uh, we appreciate all the people what are we at now? 4,400? Yeah, and, and, and at this point, uh, we have two anniversaries coming up, right? We have our own anniversary of, of five years, and then we have the, the 10 years on the Summer of Rage. And if I can convince McLeod and Matterall, I'm still hoping that uh, I can strong arm them to actually uh, do a show when we hit the Eurovision days, which is coming up very soon. Yeah. 
Yeah, so 4,500 people basically on our Discord. We appreciate all the people that are there that want to talk and leave room for you to say what you need to say without being too disrespectful and destroying the place like we've destroyed everything else. But thank you, everybody, for being a part of Talking in Stations over these last uh, five years. Uh, that is all we have time for this week. We will see you next week on Talking in Stations. Wow. These numbers kind of shock me when I think about it. All right, where's my convict shirt? Caleb, I was going to come at you. <laughs> Caleb wanted me to wear a bandana, and I'm like... I fucking want you to do uh, Jesus Mataral. It's, it's going to be glorious. <laughs> It will be the best character ever.